of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, as your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens, so may we also ascend in heart and mind and continually dwell there with him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson from Acts chapter 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men by them in white robes, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. The shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. The epistle reading from Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. This morning, the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
As I was flying back from the East Coast this week, and it's so wonderful to be home and to see you, as I was over the clouds and had already begun praying and working on a message for today, I saw from a new perspective on the world our need to look up, to see things from God's angle, from his perspective, from how he sees us. Just in time, we have the ascension. Just in time, we are supplied with hope. Our sermon text is from Ephesians 1, and especially the verse of hope. We need this Ascension Day hope. Do you agree with a colleague, Pastor Charles St. Ange in Montreal, who suggests that hope is not the same as optimism? Hope is tied to action. It's not merely an attitude. Optimism is passive. While hope is active. Optimism is having a gym membership. (laughs) Hope is getting up and going jogging every day. Maybe he's right. The opposite of hope, however, is despair. It leads to inaction, guilt, and fear. Do you remember what Dr. Luther wrote? Perhaps some of you have it memorized. In his small catechism, in the part or the petition of the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. It's not that we're accusing that God would want to lead us into temptation or to tempt us. But Dr. Luther writes, we're asking the Lord would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. It's with hope that we're able to move through the day, through the the week, through the year, year by year. And without hope, everything seems to grind to a halt. But where can we find true hope? And especially this week when we'll include in prayers the people of Uvalde, Texas, people in the Ukraine, and others perhaps in our own neighborhood who feel as if the world has come to an end for them. The problem here is that there is hope that's being offered, suggested, but false hope is no hope at all. False hope causes us to live life trusting in a lie. Some of you know of these. There are many cults that have come and gone, and some are still floating around, that have fixed an end date for the world to be blown up or burned up or for Christ to come and for it to all end. And people have built their hopes around a lie in some cases that it turned out to be just not what they said. So for instance, in case you haven't noticed, the world did not end on May 21st, 2011. As predicted by Harold Camping, the self-taught biblical scholar, supposedly, who runs the multi-million dollar family radio network. Nor did it end, a little farther back, in 1967, as predicted by Sun Young Moon, the head of the Moonies. Or his revised prediction of 1989, of the 2000 year. 2,000 years, by the way, if you were like me and working in IT during the field, in the field during that time, um, 
We even got t-shirts after the year 2000 passed because of all the testing and retesting of our software and our systems and reloading patches to make sure that everything would keep going. We had, we had guys and gals there on site at midnight on, in the year 2000 to make sure that everything kept going and that nothing broke down. Even more, more notorious for me personally was Jim Jones' prediction made in 1978. Jim Jones was so certain that the world would end when his cult was about to be busted up that he ordered his followers to poison their children and themselves. We knew the parents of one of those victims when we served in a church in Southern California. False hope has a great cost. It, it's not only that which gives you painful disappointment, but it can lead to bitterness, disillusion, bad living of all kinds, rebellion against God. In short, false hope leads to despair and unholiness. You remember Jesus said, Matthew 7, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So in our text, in Ephesians 1.20, Paul ties real hope to Jesus and specifically to his ascension because God has raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. We have Real hope for our own future. Real hope is found in Christ's physical or bodily ascension into glory, into heaven. Not just disappearing into the clouds, in through the atmosphere or to what we would call outer space, but into the presence and throne room of God, whatever that is, wherever it is, whatever it's like here a physical man, a human being who according to his human nature or mode of presence has changed. In other words, Jesus goes to heaven or returns to the father different than the way than how he came. He's a different man. He has been humiliated He's taken our nature and our sin and all our problems upon himself when he was nailed to the cross. He has been raised from the dead. He has given us his promises. And so Christ, who is one of us in his human nature, one who took upon himself all of the hopelessness, the pain, the despair of this world, he himself, one of us, is now with the Father at his right hand. You know, Jesus is not gone. He's been promoted and is taking us with him. You know, senior staff persons or politicians, when they move up, they often take their secretary or administrative executives with him or her to that higher office, to that new position. They take their trusted staff with them when they move up. Such is the case with us. Christ is the head. And he says that you baptized, you believers in Jesus, you are members of his body. The church. And if all things are under his feet, where does that put you and me and those who are in faith? It means that all things are under our feet as well, that we are raised with him in baptism. And we're trusted not because we're innately trustworthy, but because Jesus has called us, because he has redeemed us. And so in verse 18, it says he's given us the riches 
of his glorious inheritance in the saints. It is Jesus who's called us to sainthood by the will of the Father. And it is by the Spirit that we are given this wisdom and knowledge. This is the gospel. This is good news. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, our sins are forgiven. And we inherit a portion of his riches. We inherit his kingdom in grace. So even though we don't walk, talk, and eat, seeing his physical body here like you could see me and I can see you this morning, yet he is with us. Just think if he had not ascended, however, what kind of fight there would be as there was with the disciples to get next to Jesus, to be on his right and on his left. Instead, he ascended bodily so that he could be with us in a new mode or in the perfect mode that we need. We'll celebrate more of that next Sunday on Pentecost. And if you have anything in red, I'll invite you to wear it. And join me in wearing red and celebrating the gift of God's Spirit next Sunday on Pentecost. But he has given us all good things. And we can live lives of hope, being in his presence forever. His word and sacraments guarantee that he's with us. We do have hope. We do have hope in a dying world. While our world is flailing in hopelessness, reaching for this, screaming out about that, back and forward. And just when you think it's over, you hear more of it again and again. Reiterations, even if the names have changed and the dates have changed, the same stuff over and over. We hear a message of hopelessness every day. The climate is changing. Our cities will be flooded. Our coast destroyed by waves of hurricanes. This more recent viruses will take away our freedoms and lives. It's true. Faith in institutions is collapsing and people are turning ever increasingly to violence to solve their problems in a world that thinks it's so sophisticated. The market for hope is wide open and it's urgent because many are in the business of selling false hopes. You hear these day by day. This pill will help you lose weight, make you healthy. Invest in this stock or this fund and you'll be rich. Or if you vote for this person, they're really going to fix all the problems or this party. No, we have all kinds of promises That could very well be wolves in sheep's clothing. But Jesus' ascension gives us real hope. You know there is a God, that he cared enough for you to come to this earth, to redeem you, that he was crucified, died, and now is seated with the Father in heaven. Ascension doesn't mean gone. It means present here in the way that he has said. That is our hope. So even though we celebrate Christmas and we celebrate the baby Jesus in the manger and the angels and the shepherds, Easter has its lilies in the empty tomb and bewildered disciples. And Pentecost will push us to go boldly and speak of this. But ascension is unique and essential. It is our hope, our gospel. It centers our faith and strengthen us for for what lies ahead. It gives us the promise of a better and eternal and perfect future. Complete healing and all the pleasures and joys of being in God's presence. So, So look up. Christ ascended to assure us, to assure you of our eternal place with him. And as we sang this hymn, 
or we're learning to sing this hymn. Verse 5 of hymn 494, we sing, He has raised our human nature on the clouds to God's right hand. There we sit in heavenly places. There with him in glory stand. Jesus reigns adored by angels. Man with God is on the throne by our mighty Lord's ascension. We by faith behold our own. That is our hope. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.